Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another episode of the Two and a Half Cents Podcast. And I'm being joined by Sergeant, aka Bradley. Yo. As well as Chris, aka CGM87. Hey, what's up? As well as an unusual guest that you probably wouldn't expect to be on his podcast, former NFL player and realtor, Anthony Armstrong. How's it going, man? What is going on, man? I got sleeping kids. I got baby shark in my head. I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. <laughs> oh, my God. I'm so glad my kids got out of the baby shark phase already. See, I think my mom got my got my oldest son onto this baby shark kick, and now it's like, baby shark on repeat. I'm like, good Lord, I'm tired of this damn song. I'm but so it's tired of it. Three billion streams, though. It's got three billion streams. Like, can you believe that? I can't believe it. You know, Chris <laughs> actually sent me a DM as he normally does anytime he finds like an interesting video on the internet. He showed me a video where I don't know what baseball game it was. It's but they, the it, Nationals have a player who's a walk-up song is baby shark so now the whole stadium does it see there see that's why baseball is not a sport it's like an <laughs> epidemic it's an epidemic yeah it exactly. is but we we uh we appreciate you for making the time to come on here um like i said it's not something based off of our previous podcast guests this is complete you know night and day compared to like what we normally have on here so we have some questions that if you don't mind we can ask you you are obviously welcome not to answer any of them but um we just kind of interested on your standpoint and your take being that you were kind of like on the inside and you played for you're kind of like a journeyman in so many words um oh yeah absolutely you I were a journeyman I'm... of a of an nfl player so before we get into that if you don't mind just kind of telling us about um what it means to be a journeyman in the nfl Man, I tell you, being a journeyman, it's like you, you, you have to find a way to just stick at any situation that you're at. I mean, you kind of have to be a, a, a jack of all trades. And, you know, you're, you're always on the bubble. You always got to stay hungry. Um, I mean, I was a guy when Division Two didn't have – I had a few teams come by my senior year who didn't get drafted. I went, uh, went to a rookie workout, but I failed a physical because I had just gotten out of a cast from surgery. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I didn't even play ball in 05. I was at the house all depressed, drinking uh, MGD and playing Madden. And then eventually I got invited to play some flag football, and I went out there and did well. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to give this football thing a try. Um, but then bouncing around with a team in Odessa, the Odessa Roughnecks, and moved up to the Dallas Desperados of the Arena Football League and then eventually got to Miami uh, when that whole Dallas conglomerate made their way down there. So it was really all about taking advantage of opportunities, you know, bouncing it, bouncing around, just trying to do whatever you could do to make a team and, and try to impress somebody. So I guess my question is, which, which ones, I mean, I know the NFL is like the, uh, the ultimate goal for football is get in the NFL and play well and whatever, but which is more fun arena football or the NFL? Like, I mean, arena football yeah. is a lot more fast-paced, and it's usually like one or two plays, and you're and you're in the end zone. Yeah, yeah. Arena football, I think it's a great product, and it it, it is a lot of fun. It's much more family friendly. One, because it's much more affordable. Um, but the fans, I mean, have you all been to a hockey game? I'm assuming. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. yeah, plenty. Okay, so you know those seats right up on the glass. Imagine that there's no glass, and there's a player lined up right there. So like. You know, if somebody gets knocked into the crowd, the ball goes into the stands, you get to keep those things. Well, you don't get to keep the player, but you throw the player back, keep the football. <laughs> but, like, all, the, all the action is just so fast-paced. Like, even if you don't know the rules, everybody knows what a touchdown is. And, and knowing that the score will look like a basketball game, you know, 80-something to 70-something, like, it'll be crazy. That's a much, it's, it's much more fun because there's a lot more, there's a lot more going on um, the, the NFL is obviously the, the pinnacle of where you want to get to, but it's, there's, a, there's something to the game that if you, if you know football, you can, you can see the game playing out. You can see the chess match going on. Like, I love this past Super Bowl. Everybody hates it because it was, it was a low-scoring game. It was all defense. Um, it was all defense, yes, but even though I played offense, oh, God, I'm, about to, I'm coughing here. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
even though I played offense, I can still appreciate a very well uh, coached game. And so it was fun to see the pieces get moved back and forth and see how Belichick was stopping McVeigh and Wade Phillips was doing a good job against Tom Brady and those guys. So it, they're two different animals, um, but I think everybody loves the NFL just because of big hits. But you get those in, in, uh, in Arena League too. Yeah, and Anthony, in the last couple of years, we've started seeing a lot more holdouts, uh, starting last year with Le'Veon Bell, where usually they would come to the table and get a deal done in uh, training camp and maybe meet in the middle or so. But now we're seeing Le'Veon Bell miss the whole season, and this year we have Ezekiel Elliott, Melvin Gordon, and uh, Trent Williams all holding out. What do you think? This Is this becoming a new trend? And well, how do you think these all get resolved? Well, uh, in regards to holdouts, I think it's something that players are starting to see how, I think it starts with the NBA. And you see how the NBA, those players can dictate where they go, how much they get paid, and, and what their team looks like. Um, football is not set up that way. The CBA is not set up, it's not very player friendly. Uh, first of all, you don't have guaranteed contracts. And so the, the goal in the NFL is to get as much guaranteed money as possible and get your market mm -hmm. value. So where people are thinking, obviously, you know, we we'll have to forget how much money Le'Veon left on the table by not playing. He made so much more by waiting to go get that guaranteed money in his contract with the Jets. And so you want to get paid what you're worth. I mean, Michael Thomas, we all know he's been balling his whole career and he was set to make one million dollars this year. And for him to be the top receiver on that team and one of the best receivers in the league, it don't it didn't make any sense for him to make one million dollars. So he's you know rightly due to get that contract that he had. And that's what players are doing now. They're trying to take control of the situation and get the money that's that's deserved of them. And now you talk about the holdouts. Um, Trent, you know, he I think he has something going on with the medical staff and he, you know, that's a distrust between the team. Can't really speak too much to that one because I'm not in the building any longer. Um, but Zeke, he has all types of leverage. I mean, he's led the league in rushing, been in Pro Bowl. He's, he's the guy that makes the Cowboys offense go. Right. And if you take him off the field, mm -hmm. it's going to change the way the defenses respect that team, and they're going to put more pressure on Dak. They're, gonna, they're not going to have to stack the box as, box as much, and it's going to make that offense struggle a little bit. Now, he deserves to definitely get paid. You got to find a way to pay this guy to get him back in the fold. Um, but Melvin Gordon, I, I, he has no leverage. I mean, they already drafted running backs last year. They drafted another, another running back this past draft. And he's just now starting to turn a corner. I think he needs to show up to training camp, actually prove that he's worth more money and earn it. Whereas Zeke, He's already outplayed that contract, and he needs to get paid uh, by the Cowboys. I mean, with, with the issue with Bell, too, he, he actually lost money taking the New York deal over the deal Pittsburgh gave him. But I think it was more of a locker room issue for, for him. Yeah that, seems, yeah. that seems to be like the center of the controversy in Pittsburgh is how the locker room yeah. plays out. And I think that's a lot on, that's a lot on Tomlin because he kind of lost control of his own locker room. Yeah, there's, I mean, there's so many different personalities going in there, and then it, it gets tough whenever you start to see one position or one player get treated one way, um, and it kind of pushes other guys to the side. I mean, it's hard, it's hard, to, it's hard to manage those uh, multiple personalities that you got going on in there. I mean, obviously, Le'Ve Le'Veon's one of the best running backs in the game. A.B., one of the best receivers in the game. And it was time for those guys to, to, to branch out and go into new, to new pastures. And they both got what they wanted. And, you know, I think they're all going to be successful. Um, but we'll, it's going to be interesting to see what happens in Pittsburgh. But they're such a great organization. I mean, they, them, the Packers, the Patriots, they, they live off of consistency. You know, the right. same head coach for Absolutely. however long. I, th I, think the, the, I think the Steelers have had, like, what, three head coaches since the 70s. Yeah, you know, I think like so. Chuck Knoll, and then it was uh, Bill Cowher, and now it's Tomlin. You don't see that anymore, you know? You see, I mean, shoot, the, the Cardinals fired their coach uh, after one year. Like, and there's, a reason, there's a reason why they're not successful, because they don't have consistency. <laughs> when, uh, when, I, when, I look at, when I look at coaches going in and out, I look at, I look at Cleveland. They, they have a new head oh, coach yeah. or a new it's coach. It's a revolving door out there. Here. Yeah, and as yeah. a Redskins fan, I'm shocked that Gruden's still here with six years. 
because that doesn't happen with Dan Snyder very often. Yeah, I know. And I mean, with with them getting Dwayne Haskins, uh, if if they if they're gonna give the keys to Dwayne, they need to at least try to keep the same head coach around him. It doesn't help a player when you're always changing head coaches, and every coach comes in with their own scheme and the way they want to do things. And if they don't feel like he's the type of player they want to work with, then you're gonna have to see him go somewhere else, and then he's gonna have to start his career all over. And they're gonna be yelling out, you know, he he's a bust and all this other mess. And it's it's not fair to the players. Whenever, you know, you can only, if, if they're the chef of the offense, but they're only given a certain menu by the head coach, and that's not their specialty, then you start to have an issue. And that's why I think that's a lot of people are saying, you know, putting it. Check. Yeah, I mean, for real. Like, if, if you're the chef and I walk in and all I got is quinoa and, and, and cauliflower, and you're like, what the hell is this? <laughs> I want, I, I, I'm, I'm a barbecue guy, but you're giving me all this, you know, vegan food, you're not going to thrive. So you kind of yeah, have to absolutely. make sure two, you got to make sure those two pieces match together. And if you meld it right, I mean, look at look at Belichick. And he's done a great job of, he puts players in a position to be successful on the things that they're good at. So if you're good at running an out route to the left at five yards, that's basically all you're going to run all day. He's going to hide it multiple different ways, but you're going to do what you do best to be successful. It's not going to force a square peg into a round hole. I don't like saying anything good about the Patriots, but you can't really say anything bad about Belichick and Brady. They've got six it's rings. Just... Um, hey, you, got, we, you have we, to. We you love have to, to hate them. Greatness, exactly. I mean, absolutely. But you got to respect greatness at some point. And I mean, I, I was a guy where you know I was always like, man, I want the Patriots to lose. But then it's like, <laughs> you don't really, you don't, you don't get a chance to see a dynasty like this and a team that's successful. Every single year, they're like, they're done. Brady's old. He's going he's gonna to fall off the cliff. And what does he do? Goes and wins another ring. You know, and he comes back mm-hmm. and he does it again. And he does it again. Like, at some point, you just got to be like, you know what? They're great. They're just a great team overall. Let's just try to emulate what they're doing with where we're at. I think a big key to Brady's success is that he almost never gets hit. Yeah, he's always yeah. upright. That guy, that guy is really well protected. And when you look at people like, I don't know, like, I'm a big Steelers fan, so I watch a lot of Steelers games. So that's the only thing I have to relate it to. Is Ben for a long time was like the most sacked quarterback in the NFL. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it, it goes with their offense, but I mean, their their offensive line has always been one where it's not the best. Um, and and he's just a, I mean, hell, he's big as an offensive lineman, so he's able <laughs> to take those hits. But. You know, you've seen you've seen him limping around and hobnobbing around and, and all that where he's not going to be able to last as long. I mean, he's been playing forever, but those hits take a toll on you. You know, you don't, I don't see him going to play into his 40s uh, like Brady and, and Drew Brees are. Yeah. So, yeah, like quick you. question for you. Because of the fact that we have uh, a lot of young listeners, and a lot of them, for a fact I know, are, are actually student athletes or college athletes, what are some, if you were to go back um, a decade and tell your younger self um, or to point out certain things that you wish you knew going into the NFL or preparing for the NFL, what kind of advice can you give to the younger people that are, uh, you know, like I said, younger athletes who are aspiring to go into the NFL? Well, man, you, the main thing is you have to find a way to get better every single day. You know, um, and try to be, I always preach trying to be a, a well-rounded athlete, a well-rounded player. You know, I, I've, I've called a lot of high school games and those offenses, they really ask guys to do one or two things. It's like run a go or run a slant. And when you get to the NFL and they're asking you to run 10, 15 different routes, they don't transition very well. Or whenever there's uh, they would always ask, hey, what do you play? I say, I play receiver. And they say, well, which, which position, X, Y, or Z, or, or what? And I was like, no, I play all of them. Like, I, know, I knew the entire playbook inside and out. I could go in any position and, and be successful at it rather than saying, I only know what the X does on this play. And so if you put yourself into a corner and you're only good at one thing, then you just limit what you're going to be able to do. You know, you, you have to be able to cover a kick, play some, ki- uh, play some special teams. You're going to have to be able to do some of the grunt work, go out there and block, and just find a way to improve yourself overall. I mean, if you're great at one thing and you know how to do everything else, 
it'll all work out to where they'll put you in the position to be most successful, but you can't walk in here saying all I do is run go routes because teams are going to be prepared for that and they're going to stop you at some point in time. Yeah, Mike Wallace. <laughs> yeah, but he, 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 was, he was successful at what he did, you know what I mean? But he, but, he was fast. But after, all he had to do was run a straight line. He, he was left, fast. Yeah, he was. But after he left <laughs> Pittsburgh and, you know, you started getting into teams to where uh, offenses where they weren't necessarily pushing the ball downfield, it was, it was <clears throat> what he was going to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, so it's, it's like <laughs> – it's it's like I don't know. It's 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 very interesting. I just I'm just always trying to get people to be more well-rounded. Um, I've worked some Under Armour camps, and every time we do one-on-ones, every receiver wants to run and go. And I'm like, don't run. I'm like, run something else before you run and go, because you gotta you have to give the DB something else to think about. Because if I know you're just gonna run 40 yards straight downfield, I'm gonna just back up, or I'm gonna be ready for it every single time, and I can shut it down. Give yourself a chance to be successful. Do something else. Yeah. Um, another thing that's coming up is the CBA that the NFL and the Players Association have yet to come to an accord on. And one of the proposals the league has is the 18-game season, but players are only eligible for 16 games. What's your take? Because I'm in the camp that maybe that gives guys more opportunities, but it's not – it's not the best product, and you actually have the NBA chastising teams for sitting their players. So what's your take on that in the NFL? Well, I think, one, if you're going to play 18 games um, and then try to say, well, you're only eligible for 16, first off, you need to guarantee the contracts. You need to guarantee the money that you're going to give to these guys because they're still going out to practice. So that's going to be another two weeks that they're going to have to go out there and get beat up, even if they're not playing. I mean, how are you going to work this out? You're going to have to expand the rosters to allow more players to come in. But then if I'm thinking about it, if I'm a coach and I understand, okay, I don't have my best two players or I I have to sit somebody out for two games, I would much rather sit them out for the first two games of the year. Or maybe I'll sit them out for the two games in the middle of the season. Because if I know I can still still go 14-2, and let's say the Patriots, they can still go 14-2, and without Brady and, 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 and whomever else and sit them out the first two games of the year, you might as well, you're going to eliminate, what, the last two preseason games? There's so many moving That's parts That's what to I've that. heard. You, I mean, you're going to move so many moving parts. Like, what's the point of it, you know? Like, you're going to eliminate the first, last two preseason games. Okay, well, then I'm just going to sit my players anyways. And then they're, I'm going to sit my players for those first two games of the year. Now you're, now you're televising these preseason games on, on prime time. And it doesn't even have the best players in there, so yeah, I don't. I don't yeah. think that's. The, I don't think that's the way to go. I think that. I really think that they just need to guarantee the contracts. Um, I mean, there's really no other way to do it. Adding games isn't going to do anything for the players. It's just going to put them at more risk, and you're going to ask more guys to get out there. And there's going to be some guys that are only, literally, only going to get to play in those two games. They're not going to get to play any other time. It's going to be pointless. doesn't make much sense to me. Um, I, I think it's just something that sounds good. And, and really, I've always thought they need to get players into those rooms that, that are actually the people that are making decisions for the season. Because it, it makes no sense to why you've got these 50, 60-year-old men who haven't played the game and aren't playing the game, can't physically do the things that you're asking these players to do and not have the people that are on the field and in between the lines helping make some of those decisions. Oh, it makes sense. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I just figured it would still be two preseason games, but just thrown out throughout the season. It's basically what it comes out to. Basically. Or, it does, I mean, yeah. You already see it now when the team clinches the playoffs, they sit their players in the last two games of the year and they get them ready for the playoffs. And now you give me two other games where I have to sit somebody out. Like you're just you're just gonna weaken the product over two more regular season games. Yeah, and on the other side, what happens when uh, some coach, I guess, doesn't plan ahead for that? Like, and then oh. they end up needing those last two wins, and they have to play their backups in the last two games. Right. I mean, well, that would fall on his shoulders, though, wouldn't it? That's true, but still, that would still be like as as a fan, you would see that, and you'd be like, "Well, that's a loss, and that's a loss. We're out of the playoffs." 
right? I mean, it, it, it adds another element of preparation. Um, and, and I can guarantee you this much, those coaches, if that were to go down, they're going to be sitting up there having so many conversations about how things would play out. They're already going to be looking at the schedule to see, well, what game could we sit guys out in? And it, but, I mean... Anytime you sit I mean, a healthy gonna... player, that's, that's not a good look for the squad. Um, yeah, I mean, especially if you're paying three hundred dollars a pop to come sit down and watch a game, you you ho- expect to see the best products on the field, and when it's not out there, you're gonna be uh, really yeah. ba- you know badly disappointed with that. Yeah, I mean, and 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 I mean, essentially, there, if there's what fifty, there's forty six guys that suit up right now that are active, and there's mm-hmm. eight, uh, you know, it goes up to fifty three or fifty four are active. So then there's seven guys that are already sitting. There's no way that you're going to be able to sit somebody down without having to expand that roster almost by double to have enough bodies to be like, okay, hey, this is the game that you get to play. You know, you got a practice squad guy who isn't ready to play right now. Now he's forced to play for two games at some Mm -hmm. point in time. You know, like... You just, just just look at the roster. You got to sit down your starters, and that's 22 people. So now you got to find another 22 people to fill in for them at some point in time. There's not even enough. There's not even 22 additional players on the roster to actually be able to do that. So it, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, that's, that's a true. great point. And then you know the other side of it is you can't sit your best receiver and your best and your starting quarterback because now you're. Now you have a backup quarterback thrown to a backup receiver, and that hurts the product even more. And, you know, I've never understood the inactives, the seven inactives. Do you think they should change that and let all 53 players be active? Because I I just don't see the point in the inactives. It's almost like, hey, if you get hurt, well, you're going to be lack depth at this position. Sorry, too bad. Yeah, I mean the the inactives sometimes they're they're left inactive because they're protected. Um, the way that the the way that the contracts and the situations go is that you know if somebody's on a practice squad, another team can steal them off of your practice squad, but they have to become activated for that other team. So what some teams will do is that they will stash a player. Let's say let's say they draft a player and he's not developing the way they were expecting so they would just leave him on the active roster but he would be he would be inactive during the during the games and we've all seen those guys you know like this guy can't get on the field but he just he's traveling with the team he's going to all the games but he just doesn't play so that's why they do mm-hmm. that yeah some of those some of those guys are just protected so that another team can't steal them and that's how the Steelers ended up with uh, Chris Boswell when they needed to get rid of Josh Scobie. They just yeah. yanked him off the Giants practice squad. Yep, and that's and that's what happens, you know, because there's every team. I remember going into uh, the Dolphins, one of the player personnel room, and they had a, a literal for, Florida ceiling dry erase board, and they had players that they were watching on every single team, every single practice squad. They knew what guys they had eyes on. And they were saying, okay, well, and in their minds, they're thinking, if this guy becomes available, we're going to cut our guy to get him. And so they know which pieces that they want to move, but if they, act, if they put somebody on the active roster, now this guy, you can't touch him. So now you got to find another guy that you would take. And so if you got all these different moving pieces and potential you know, situations that are coming about, you got to be prepared for it. And it's... It it gets to be a little sticky in there. I mean, as a practice squad player, you'd love to get activated because that means you get to play, and then you get a you essentially get a pay raise. So being able to um, get on the active roster is huge. It's key. Um, but you know, sometimes sometimes a guy that's active and and you really uh, if you're inactive, you find out ninety minutes before the game starts. Oh, that's awful. You may know. Oof. Yeah, you but you may know during the week. You know, but they don't have to announce it until 90 minutes before. So technically, coming into it, if there's a if there's a starting receiver who 
is, is nursing an injury and they have to wait until the game starts or, or right before game time to decide if he's going to play, they'll have that other player ready to go and they'll activate him and sit the other guy down. That's got to be demoralizing at some point. You know, if you're getting into the zone, I mean, I know you guys do, you know, you, every player has their own like pregame ritual, whether it's to, um, you know, read a book, listen to music, some music, or just zone out completely. You're kind of getting into the zone to play. And for them to come in 90 minutes prior and be like, hey, look, you're not playing tonight. That's got to yeah, be demoralizing. Know, it, 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 it it sucks. It sucks sometimes, you know, especially, you know, like, like you were saying, you do prepare to play. I mean, even, even if you are active, you still may not touch the field and you have to prepare as if you're going to be the next guy up because if somebody hurt gets hurt, now you're responsible for everything that they were doing. Even, even if you haven't gotten the reps, even if you haven't, you know, you may not have ran with the ones all week or all season, then all of a sudden the top receiver goes down and I got to step in and do what he does and they're expecting me to perform similarly. You know, obviously, you know, if Julio Jones goes down, they're not going to think, okay, this undrafted rookie is going to do what Julio does, but he sure as hell better execute the plays if, as if Julio's in there. Like, you have to know what to do, even if you're not slated to play. Right. That's got to be nerve-wracking, too, if you get into the game and you're trying to fill the shoes of, like, Julio Jones or Antonio Brown or something. You've never man. played a, in an actual NFL game before. I mean, you know, the the thing is, is they're, they're not just going to pull somebody out of the stands and say, hey, uh, row, row 13, seat 12, um, you're up. Like it's, it's not like, <laughs> it's not like that, you know what I mean? But it's, you, you, you've been through practices, you've gone against the starting defense, you've ran the plays, you've done it before. Now you're doing it in front of 80,000 80, people with the lights on and, and the cameras are on you. And, you know, the, the pressure is different in that light, but it's, it's still football at the end of the day. Um, I always say, that, I'm like, don't overthink it. You've done this before. You've played the game before. Just go out there and execute like you know how to and take advantage of the opportunity that's presented to you because there's a lot of guys who've gotten that chance. I mean, if you go back to, I don't even know what year, I think maybe 08, Victor Cruz, he stepped in wearing a single-digit number against the Jets in a preseason game, and he had three touchdowns. And everybody was like, who the hell is this guy? And next, <laughs> and next thing you know, you know, he ends up starting and playing, and then he's like a Giants legend. Salsa dancing he, his way yeah, into the black eye of my heart. <laughs> all of that. All of that. You know, and that, that comes from being, being ready. You know, there's some guys where you just got to show up and step up to the step up to the occasion, rise to the moment, and and make those plays when they come your way. And, I mean, it's it's crazy in the league because you literally you may get one opportunity, one time to make a play, and if you don't make the play, they they they'll write you off. They'll write you off, even if you've never been in the game, you've never got to do it, and you get your one chance, you got to find a way to make that play. And as you start stacking those plays, you're going to get more opportunities. And hopefully, you know, uh, the, the, the top person, you know, they're expected to hit a certain amount of accuracy on their plays, but they also have a little bit more leeway. But an undrafted guy, uh, you know, a late-round draft pick, you might get one shot to make something happen. Right. So, so I guess my next question is, uh, like, if you look at, like, the previous I guess, past couple seasons, like the the two biggest examples I could think of. What do you think of like these these high played top tier players that lose their lose their minds on the sidelines and just do stupid things when things just aren't going their way? Like when uh, OBJ would like fight the the kicking net or Antonio Brown throws a Gatorade tank out on the field. Like what what does that say to you about those players or like the NFL in general? allowing them to do that without getting in trouble for it. I mean, it's 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 kind of a it's kind of a two-way street. I mean, obviously you would you don't want to see somebody, you know, lose their lose their cool, you know, on the sideline. I mean, if you think it, if you take it to a regular 9 to 5 job and you 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 do this project and then the boss says, 
no, nah, not good enough. We're not going to let you do it anymore. You don't want to see that guy come in and start flipping desks and breaking copying machines. But it also shows that they do have a passion and they care about what they're doing and they care about the product. You know, it's, mm-hmm. it's when, when you see a team that's losing, and I would hate this. I mean, I, I spent a lot of time on some bad teams. Um, and if you get out there and you're losing, but then you look down the sideline and somebody's laughing and joking and they don't, they don't, they act like they don't care that the product sucks. They don't care that they dropped the pass. They don't care that they fumbled. That'll really piss you off. You know, you don't want to see that. Now, you know, from the outside looking in, you see it on, you see it on camera and you see these guys flipping out. We don't know the full story. You know, we don't know what's going on. But I, 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 I will err on the side of saying, hey, these guys are passionate. They care about, about what's going on. It sucks to lose. It, it, it sucks to, you know, go out there and go three and out every single time. Um, but it, it, it's, a, it's a two-way street. You know, you can't really jump to any conclusions about it. Um, and to, to try to discipline them and keep these guys, like, in, in a box, to say, hey, don't show any emotion at all, that's, that's not fair either. Because if you get mad, you know, I, I know this, y'all have like a streaming page, and if you're playing a major game and then something bad happens, you're not going to be like, oh, well, you know, that happened, whatever. Like, no, you're going to be upset about it. And right. I, want, I want you to be upset about it because you care. It's the, it's the times that people don't care that's really going to, you know, rub me the wrong way. Now, sure, don't go break your controller. Don't go break your TV. Don't go break your PlayStation because that costs you some money. Um, I mean, I, I used to break my fair share of controllers back in the day. So I started, you know, having to rack up $50 a pop. You know, I was like, eh, let me, let me take a couple of deep breaths and realize, hey, it's okay. But there were times where I got mad. I, I threw helmets every now and again. I mean, I've been there. So it, just, it comes with the territory. So we touched kind of earlier on in the podcast about you being a journeyman. You played for, what, six or seven different teams? Yeah. Now, um, you know, if you can't tell by my name, I'm a Ravens fan. Obviously, Chris established he's a Redskins fan. Sarge is a Steelers fan. Uh, and I know for a fact that the majority of the Ravens players um, have residences in the Miami area. Um, so they really never move at all. And mm-hmm. they just travel with the team during the season and they move back to their homes. Is it the same way for a journeyman? Um, Are you constantly moving residences based off of the team you're currently with? Or how how does that work? I've always wondered that because, you know, uh, the whole journeyman thing interests me. I've one of my favorite players in the league is Darren Sproles. And, Mm -hmm. you know, anybody who knows anything about him knows that he's also a journeyman. Uh, There's a bunch of guys like him, but do you oh, how does the housing situation work in that case well i'll shoot i'll tell you a story of my my own situation so when i was with the redskins in 2012 um going through training camp uh, it was rg3 kurt cousins rookie year i, I ended up getting i was like the last player cut all right and i had a town home that i was renting i was paying rent there and it wasn't cheap um and I get cut and I, the Dolphins call and they're like, yo, your flight leaves in two hours. And I'm like, well, I, I don't have enough time. Can I get a little bit later flight? They're like, okay, well, it leaves in four hours. I'm like, okay. <laughs> oh my God. So, you know, I, I throw everything I can into a suitcase. Uh-huh. And I, I moved down to Miami, uh, well, Fort Lauderdale, technically that area. But I moved down there and, you know, you get a week in a hotel. And then after that, you're on your own to find your housing. And so I shacked up in this hotel, stayed in this extended stay for a little bit, and I decided, let me rent an apartment because I think I'm going to be here at least for the season. Um, about eight weeks later, they let me go. And uh, I went to Jacksonville for, for literally for a week. And so I only had to stay in a hotel there. Um, and then I went back down to Miami because, you know, I still had that apartment. And then eventually Dallas picked me up. Luckily, I'm from Dallas, so I came and I actually stayed at my mom's house, playing for the Cowboys. I was staying with my mom's house. Mind you, I'm still paying rent in Virginia. I'm still paying rent in this Fort Lauderdale apartment. So and I'm you're still paying places. rent, why? Because you can't cancel a rental agreement, right? 
Correct. I'm still in this lease. And I mean, you know, if you're if you've ever been in a lease and you try to break a lease, it costs you some money. You know, you, you can't just get out. They don't just say, OK, cool. See you later. And like, no, you have to honor the contract. Right. And there's there's some places that they work with you on it. But more times than not, you're not going to be able to. And the one in Virginia, um, the ex-girlfriend was still living in there. So I, I wasn't going to kick her out and her kids. So I'm a nice guy like that. Right. And so <laughs> I'm literally I'm literally paying rent. Probably, I don't know, maybe about four or five thousand dollars in rent in two places that I'm not Ooh. living in. Wow. And luckily, I'm, I'm shacked up at my mom's house in my old bedroom that I grew up in which was kind of ironic and full circle, but <laughs> I moved back there. So once I, once I got the opportunity uh, to close off those other, eight, those other places, I ended up buying a house in Texas. One, because I wanted to come back home, and I figured if I get on a team and if they let me go, I'm going to come back home. I want to have one place I can go back to. Um, and as a journeyman, you may not, you don't know where you're going to be for any extended period of time. So it's hard to it's hard to try to put down roots in a city that you're playing in. Cause I mean, if you're if you're last on the roster, I always felt like I was, you know, one of the last few guys on the roster. So I never knew if I was going to get cut. So I really wasn't jumping on trying to sign some year long lease. I would always kind of wait and see what I was going to get myself into before I jumped into anything. And being a being that journeyman. You really, you really are just going to live out of a suitcase. And then if you happen to stick with a team, then maybe you find some sort of living situation. Yeah, maybe you and a couple teammates shack up together. Um, some guys are, you know, uh, I've, I've heard of one guy I know, he was with Pittsburgh. He, he stayed a few times with Le'Veon. Like, he stayed at his house. And, and some, some guys are nice enough to be like, yeah, I got an extra room. You can come shack up over here. So it's it's really just you got to find a way to <laughs> you find a way to live, man. It's tough. Wow. Yeah, Anthony. One of the uh, games you were a part of with the Redskins was uh, unfortunate. The uh, Monday Night Massacre against the Eagles, but you had that amazing catch, uh, the seventy-six yard catch. How's a game like that? as a player, how does that unfold at halftime after the game, during the game, when you're having such a tough game? Oh uh, man, it's, there's, it's, it's shoot. It's, it's like, it's, it's almost a couple ways to look at it. Cause obviously we started out that game and there was like a, almost a little bit of a fight going on right before going into the locker room before kickoff. And so everybody was fired up and ready to go. Um, then they came out and bombed us with uh, Deshaun Jackson on play number one. And we're like, all right, cool. That's a little punch to the gut. But, hey, everybody's still fired up and ready to go. And then things just kept going right for Philly. Not much was going right for us. And we were down by a lot early. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we still felt as if, hey, if we can get a few stops and offense gets to clicking – we can fight back. I mean, you've seen games happen like that before. I think the, the one, one of the classic ones was, I think, the Oilers and the Bills. And they were down like 35 to something, and they fought back and won. And so we know that it's possible, but it's just, a, it's just an uphill battle. And you just got to make sure that everything comes together. Um, you know, there, I mean, and I'd be remiss. I'd be lying if I didn't say that there were, there were some people that just felt defeated. You know, there's, there's, there's that... There's that uh, thought that comes into your mind like, man, when's this game going to be over? You know, it's cold, it's rainy, and we're getting our head beat on, on primetime television. I just want to go home, you know, but we got to finish out the game. Let's keep fighting. You want to keep fighting, scratching, and clawing, and, and hopefully things get going your way. Uh, but it, it does suck whenever you just get down that early. And, you know, it feels like there's nothing you can do. But you got to keep fighting, man. You got to keep fighting. I mean, we... We definitely felt that if we stacked a few good plays together, we knew that something could happen. Uh, it just it just didn't work out for us that day. What would you What would you say is the single biggest? Uh, and you can take this question either way. Is the single biggest person that influenced you on your journey in the NFL or to the NFL? Or what What is to you the single best moment as an NFL player? Man, let's see, my, my journey was one of those 
that it's it's very rare. You don't hear much about it. Then nobody really takes the path that I did. Um, so in the beginning, it was it was really me, you know, just driving myself. I I, I use the term graduating every year. Um, you know, if I was going to continue trying to play football. And I knew I still had a little bit of time under my belt just because, you know, I was still young. I was on my mama's insurance and didn't have a lot of expenses. So um, I just had to stay hungry to to keep trying to reach this goal. I mean, you see, I would see the draft come and go and everybody's birth years were getting closer and closer to mine. And, you know, my draft came and went and, you know, I knew I could play the game. I knew I had the speed to get up there. I just had to get in front of the right people. Um, so getting into the league was more about a personal hunger, trying to prove something. Um, you know, my mom was an inspiration because she worked so hard. Um, and I knew that if she could do it, I could do it. Um, and so she was a big inspiration. And then you get into the league, and then you just you start competing with people, and then you start seeing certain players that, are, that you learn from. I know Santana Moss is, is like a big brother to me. Um, just seeing how he worked, how he prepared, how he took care of his body, I just started following him, you know, and London Fletcher is another one of those guys, uh, Lorenzo Alexander, I mean, I think he's still playing, he's like 36, 37, so we're the same age, and you see, you see the way those guys worked, and it, you, you're stupid if you don't try to emulate what they're doing, you know, there's no need to try to reinvent the wheel, you, you see guys that have had success, and there's a reason that they've played for 10-plus years in the league. Right. If you, yeah. you got you to gotta see what they're doing and then follow them and, and let them guys lead you and, and take you in the right direction. Um, but it, it ends up, I mean, it's, 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 it's more of a personal battle. It's like it's mental. It's your own. It's you versus you. That's kind of my favorite, favorite phrase, you versus you, and, and being able to overcome the difficulties i mean there's plenty of times where i could have been like screw this i'm out like i just want to go back home um this playbook's too confusing i'm i'm tired of you know going to head to head against leron landry and <laughs> you, you, you get competitive man you get competitive and i know i knew that i wanted to play i wanted the ball i wanted to show what i could do um and i wasn't going to let somebody else put limitations on what i on what i could achieve mm. Yeah, I've never seen a player as ripped as Laurent, though. Man, man, he he was he's huge and yeah. Um, so here's a here's a ten year old yeah, question. I, I, <laughs> um, yeah, right, ten year old. One. Hold on, let's see. So <laughs> this, we're we're doing we're doing um, inside run. It was a period where basically every single every single play that was going to be called was going to be inside the tackles. And it's pretty uh -huh. physical, you know, you've got your pads on. And as a receiver, you know, I had to do a push crack or do this insert where I would have to hit Leron every single play. And out of these 10 plays in this series, one, I had to go and hit Leron. About halfway through, I was like, these guys are testing me right now. They want to see what I'm made of. Am I just a guy that runs fast? Or can I actually go in and do some of the dirty work uh, that's going to be asked of me? And so I, I stepped up to the challenge. Obviously, I made the team. Um, but it was, it was one of those tough moments, you know, where it's like either you put up or you shut up. And I, I can say that if I were to back down from that challenge, I wouldn't have made that team. Um, you know, I'd have probably, probably got cut. There's no telling if I would have landed on another squad or not. But that was one of those days that I had to step up to the challenge and, and, and show that I, I belong to be in the league. Well, I mean, after watching some of the highlights from your games, I kind of wish I'd have paid more attention to the NFC then. But I had I had my own stuff going on, and I was more worried about my my Steelers that were. Oh yeah, no, I mean y'all y'all had a good <laughs> squad. I mean, mean y'all went to the Super Bowl one of them years, isn't it? Yeah, uh, I think we lost to Green Bay in one of those years. <laughs> yeah, 2010. Matter of fact, 10 years old. That was. Uh, we we that also was... beat we also beat uh beat the Cardinals in 2008, I think. Yep, that's true. Yep, yep. <laughs> See, I mean, you you had some good things. Why there was no need to spend too much time over there watching the NFC East, but uh, <laughs> well, I mean, at the time I lived in New York, so I watched a lot of NFC East games anyway. Because uh, my, okay. my father in law is a huge Giants fan, so he I was like all he was all Giants. happy that the Patriots cannot beat the NFC East in the Super Bowl at all. 
Yeah, I loved. I like. I like playing against the Giants. I had most of my touchdowns against those guys. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess what I was gonna ask you is, this is like, this is like a question a ten year old would ask. Um, if if you had your choice of any team you could have played for, uh, before before you got before you got signed by Miami or whatever, um, who would it have been? What team would you want? What team did you want to go to? Yeah, just... I mean, grow, growing up in Dallas, obviously, you know, you want to play for the Cowboys. You want to wear the star. And I was able to do that, you know, and that was, that was pretty cool to be able to play for your hometown. Um, all my family and friends were, were cheering for me. And they cheered for me when I played for Washington. They're like, we'll cheer for you except for two games of the year. And they're like, we, <laughs> we, hope, they're like, we hope you catch for 500 yards and five touchdowns, but y'all lose. Like, it was that kind of thing. Um, but, like, once you get in the league, you know, you just want to stick anywhere. Um, but then once you're in also, there's certain players that you want to play with. You know, like, it would have mm-hmm. been, 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 been great to play with Peyton Manning. It would have been great to play with Tom Brady, you know, Drew Brees, Aaron Rodgers, you know, Phillip Rivers, those guys. Those are the guys that you want to you wanna line up with and have them throw the football to you. Um, you know, I remember playing – against Tom Brady and, and Peyton. And generally, you know, when the offense is on the sideline, you're sitting down on the bench, you're looking at the plays, you're looking at pictures, you're talking about the next series. I think everybody was actually standing up trying to see what these guys were going to do. You know, they're, they're, they're that special. And, to you know, that's, that, that's the situation that you want to get into is like, what, what players do I want to play with? And I mean, I, I wasn't a guy where I was going to try to force a trade and be like, trade me to New England. like. No, I, I, was, I was happy being on a team, but being able to, if, if I could have chosen, you know, who to play with, it would have been with one of those great quarterbacks just to see what it was like to be in that organization. And I mean, I, I would have loved to go play with the Patriots. I mean, I think I got the, the mentality, the intelligence to get out there and, you know, deal with what Belichick is going to bring to you because um, they, they do a great job of just taking – no name well, people and turning them into superstars. I was just gonna say the thing about the Patriots though is they take people that other people would just be like, okay, well you're gonna be like a third string whatever, and they make yep. them, they put them up front and they still end up doing well even with yep. people that you would think wouldn't be as good. Yeah, I mean, I mean they their big thing is do your job, you know, mm-hmm. and, and and like I said earlier, he's gonna Belichick is putting you in a position to do what you do best. You know, Edelman, Wes Welker. Wes Welker didn't run a route deeper than probably 10 yards, you know. <laughs> but he got right. beat up a lot. <laughs> yeah, he got beat up a lot, but he, but he did his job every single time. Edelman, he does his job every single time. Very rarely do they go down the field. You're not going to see that happen. You know, Wes Welker wouldn't necessarily be Wes Welker if he were to go to another team who doesn't know how to utilize his best skills. Yeah, he wasn't that successful in Denver, I didn't think. You know, he did okay, but... Yeah, he... Uh, he well, that's the thing with the Patriots. With Manning. That's the thing with the Patriots, too. Like, you know, as soon as the Patriots release you, like, they've gotten everything, every single thing out of you that they can, and I'm now sure you're, like, spare point. parts. <laughs> Pretty, I'm I mean, not sure what you're at point. Every team you go to ends up going to the Super Bowl. <laughs> yeah, it's... I mean, I mean, shoot, Legarrette Blunt is gonna do what he does every single time. But that's that's the one. I mean, sometimes I think a lot of coaches get they're very prideful in the fact of saying my system works. Like you have to do it my way because my system works. And I think the, I think a great coach is somebody that's gonna be able to take the guy that does really good on five yard outs and then put him in positions and get creative of helping him run five yard outs and, and favorable matchups. Don't you, don't try to make that guy that can't, you know, he only runs a four eight and try to make him run go routes all day because that's not going to work. You know, you have to, you have to at least try to put somebody in the right position. I mean, don't, don't take a Ferrari out there on a, on a road, on a, uh, on like a off road course. Like that doesn't make sense. Right. Exactly. So, unless you have money to throw at a Ferrari that you want to get rid of, well, right, right. But then once <laughs> again, once again, now they're going to be looking at this this broken down Ferrari like this guy can't. He's not durable. And it's like, well, 
he's not durable because they got him running all over this, all through the middle and trying to block safeties and stuff. Like, that's not his game. They call those uh, medicine balls, right? Shoot, I've never heard that term. Like, <laughs> you know, when, when, when they have you running across the middle towards a linebacker or a safety, and it's like, it's like they, they know it's going to be one of those bang bang plays where you catch the ball and immediately you're going to get hit by somebody. Oh, I'm sure Juju yeah. Smith Schuster blocking, uh, what's his name, for the Bengals when he laid him out. Vontez? Yeah. Yeah, he laid yeah, him perfect. out. I was like, yes. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, see that now. Every Everybody wants to get one of those every now and again. Every every receiver wants to get. I hit, I hit a D tackle one time. I was feeling good. And I, <laughs> I, I, I peeled back on a D tackle and I knocked him over. But I, I hadn't peeled back on anybody since then because I shoot that that took a toll on me, you know. Well, I mean, I think Juju got fined for that too. Oh yeah, he, like, he did. He stood over him and taunted him. He did. I mean, he was trying to. He was also trying to defend his guy. You know, uh, yeah. I think I think the last time they had played, Burford got a hold of AB pretty good. Yeah, and, I, th- and, I think. You know, I think it had a lot to do with the fact that every time that the Steelers played the Bengals, Perfect would always do something. Like every each one of those, every one of those teams in the NFC, NFC or AFC North, when they get together, somebody's always going to get in a in a pissing contest with each other. Oh, absolutely, and absolutely. I think Perfect was involved in a lot of that, and I think Juju was just like, okay, well now I'm going to show you what's up. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. It's it's kind of one of those unwritten rules. I mean. It, I'm I'm just glad that it's not like baseball where it's like you 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 hit my guy with a ball and now I got to hit you with a ball. It's like that gun. I'd hate to be the next guy up. Like, <laughs> like damn it. Well, so and, like, Anthony, now we, I got to take it. We appreciate you for uh, taking the time here, but we want to close it out with uh, probably one more question. With I uh, guess we'd be remiss if we didn't address this. But how did your career uh, transition? Talk about a little bit about the transition from NFL to uh real estate how how does that happen go ahead and plug yourself (laughs) yeah absolutely you know know i will you know i will so anybody that's looking for a house in the texas dallas area check out my website agent armstrong realtor get on there you can search look around make yourself a little account um and and take a look at all the different uh pretty houses that we got down here uh but I found my way into real estate. It was kind of accidental. Uh, I, I was initially, well, first off, I knew that my time was coming close to an end uh, in the NFL, and I had to prepare for the transition. And I think it's like a three-year, it takes, it's like a three-year process to transition out because year one, you still feel like you can play and you're angry at everybody. You know, you're like, screw them. You know, I don't care about the Redskins. They suck. I should be out there doing that. And you're watching every single game and you're criticizing every single player. You're like, I can't believe he didn't down that kick inside the five. I would have made that play. Or I can't believe he didn't make that catch. I could have made that. You're all mad. Um, Mm -hmm. Year two, you kind of find yourself down in this depression. You don't even watch football. Sundays, you're like going to Home Depot and going to Bed Bath and Beyond. Like you don't care about football. Then year three, you finally come up out of that funk, and then you hopefully find yourself. Um, but as I was transitioning out of the game, I initially thought about coaching, like high school, um, and I, I went through the process to get my teacher certification, and I actually got these flashcards. Um, to to take the math portion, they were like, if you get a math certification, you'll have a job forever. And I'm like, bet, that's the one I'm going to go for. You know, being a PE teacher, that one, those roles are taken. So um, I was like, I'll do math. I don't mind math. And I got the the first one I opened up was trigonometry. Hmm. And I said, I've never (laughs) taken trigonometry. (laughs) I'm looking at all these like triangles and formulas and like italicized (laughs) letters. And I'm like, I have no clue what this is. So I said, (laughs) nix that plan, scrap it. Um, And plus my, for one of my friends, he's a, uh, he's a coach down here. There would be days during the season where he would not see his family. He wouldn't see his kids. He would be out of the house before they get up and he would get home after they've gone to bed. And that wasn't a life that I wanted to have. Um, and so then I, I was watching HGTV and you see all these investor shows. I'm like, I'm going to be one of those real estate investors. I'm going to set my own schedule and make all this money. And, and it worked out. Research, right? Well, I mean, I, almost. 
So I was researching it and I, you know, I'm looking at it and I'm like, okay, cool. I need to have like a realtor and a lender and a handyman and a contract. And it's like all this stuff that I got to find to make this team to find these houses. Um, but then as I was doing that, I was like, I could just get my real estate license and I can get paid to help people find houses and eventually I'll invest as I go along, as I learn the game a little bit. Um, and once I got my license, it ended up working out to the fact that I actually am still teaching and coaching people. Um, I'm just coaching people in the process of buying a home. You know, so I, now it's, it's worked out. It's almost worked out a little bit better. Um, one, there's no concussions in real estate. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I don't have to get hit. I don't have to worry about Ray Lewis coming across my head. I mean, <laughs> the worst of it, you may have like a, a tough agent on the other side, but there's really no, there's really not, there's no physical pressure behind it. Um, uh, but once I got my real estate license, I was just learning that, and I was, in, I've been, been enjoying the business side of it. I definitely enjoy helping people and, and getting to hang out with them and all the happy hours are great because I mean, I, I think you could, you could just go to all the happy hours and eat all the free food and, and break even without selling a house every year. So, um, real estate, real estate has been a lot of fun. I mean, I'm five years in it right now, having the best year of my career. Um, it, it's something I could see myself doing for the long haul. Uh, and it's, it's great because, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to work if I don't want to, um, but I also know it's, it's one of those you only eat what you kill type of games. So I'm directly responsible for my success. It's not like in the league to where I work out 20 hours a day and I study the playbook and I'm in the, I'm in the facility all the time, but coach doesn't put me on the field. Right. You know, I, get to mm -hmm. I get to determine my success. And so being able to have that ownership is huge. Um, and that's, that's definitely a part that I love about it. But and, and you enjoy what you do out, at man. the end of the day, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. It's, um, it's very fulfilling to take somebody who didn't think they could buy a house or, you know, maybe the last realtor they worked with didn't help them very much to be able to actually, you know, be at that point in their life. Uh, well, you know, buying a house is, you know, they say the American dream and it's, it means a lot to people. It's not it's only the American dream, but uh, it was rated the number one single most stressful thing you could ever do. Oh my God! See, buying a I house can, is, is I like can even it. just owning a house is stressful because the work never stops. It's always <laughs> oh, yeah. upkeep, upkeep, upkeep. Yeah, <laughs> so, it's all there's there's always something to do. And but I can never I, go back to renting. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I, and, and matter of fact, I was having this conversation last night, and somebody's like, well, I should just rent because I don't want to deal with the maintenance. I'm like, okay. I was like, I'll, I'll buy the house. You rent it from me. And then every time I have to pay for something to get maintained, I'll just up your rent. And they're like, well, what, what? And I'm like, that's what you're doing anyways. You're just, you're just, they're just going to up the rent. <laughs> if they have to put a new roof on, they're going to be like, hey, your, uh, your rent's going up next year, uh, 50 bucks. And it's going to continue to go up every single year. And if you own your house, you have the ability to essentially lock in your monthly payment. I mean, obviously, it'll, it'll change with insurance and taxes. But if you, you know that your mortgage is going to essentially stay the same for 30 years. I mean, there's and that. Then, and then there's, there's the fact that, like, if you're renting, you're essentially paying somebody else's mortgage. Exactly. Exactly. Mm -hmm. and, when, and when that home's value goes up and it's worth $100,000 more, you know, for that person to sell it, like, as a renter, you don't get any of that. And then when the new person comes in, they may kick you out, and now all you have to show for it is what? Nothing. You don't get anything out of it. You know, sure, the maintenance, you know, I don't have to take care of maintenance. Okay. But you also don't get to walk away with a $50,000 check into your bank account uh, because, you, <laughs> because you sold this house, you know, so... Yeah. For me, it's, it's, it's huge to take somebody through that process and to just show them what they do. But I got, I got a question for y'all, though. Yeah. Absolutely. So what do you normally talk about on your podcast? So just anything, really. It's, a, it's pretty much free form. Um, th you are actually the first person on that t talked about um, what exactly that they do. So we have people on here that work different jobs. 
uh, come from different walks of life. And it's free form, so we don't make anyone talk about anything pertaining to their work or anything like that. It's, it's just a, it's really chill, and it's it's not planned. Um, the topics just are right off the cuff. So La- like last week's podcast, for instance, was basically my autobiography. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, we started so, talking okay. about one thing, and then it just rolled into different stories about me and my life and whatever. And then, like the week before that, it was about something totally not connected at all. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So, I didn't know if it was. I know you had the the streaming, the gaming streaming thing. I didn't know if y'all like talked about gaming or anything. No, like that. I. It's sometimes it's, so, we we're all pretty big gamers and stuff, but um. You know, we took I on did. this podcast as like a additional, you know, we do it anyway. We talk during the streams anyway, so we figured just make a podcast out of yeah. it. Yeah, and I, I did my Madden rant last week, didn't I? Yeah, you did, and that was pretty and good. With, with, with football season coming up, I have a feeling we're going to be talking more about football. I got yeah. you. We're all like yeah. huge football fans. Although I'm pretty, uh, I'll be honest, I'm pretty, this is, as a Redskins fan, this is the least excited I've been in, since I can remember. Chris is one of those oh, yeah. fans that hates himself because <laughs> we did this thing when right when they released the uh, the schedules for the teams. We were trying to figure out, you know, what's your guess for your record for the season? And I was like, I was like twelve and fourteen, and or fourteen and twelve, or fourteen and two, or something like that. It was like no, it was twelve and four was mine, and then Raven was like thirteen and three, and then Chris was like three and thirteen. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's very narcissistic, but we love him. We keep him around. Uh, uh, it, tell me what I have to be optimistic about. <laughs> it's you know, I, you know what's going to happen. I mean, I'll, I'll say this. You know, if you look at where the Redskins are at right now, I, I think, one, I think it's good that you're kind of tempering your expectations because the team is in a transition. They're they're trying to find themselves, okay. Yep. You know, you're still you're still trying to see what you're gonna get. I mean, I, you, know, you got Colt McCoy, Case Keenum, and you got Dwayne Haskins. Obviously, those top two guys they aren't gonna be the franchise quarterback for an extended period of time. So you kind of got to make sure you set this team up to build around Dwayne Haskins. And so to come out and be like the Redskins are gonna win the Super Bowl. I think I think anybody that says that, you know, obviously that's the goal, but I, you know, realistically, I don't think that happens. Not year one. You know, we want to see growth. Uh, I want to see if Dwayne gets in. I want to see him, you know, play well. Um, I'm not I'm not putting any huge expectations on him, uh, but he's he's got some some learning to do. He's going to have some learning to do. You know, you, you're getting Darius Geis back. Uh, he was hurt. You know, he didn't get to play last year, so you want to see what he can do. Now, you know, if you get Trent back in the fold, that'll help out a lot. But you're going to get a healthy Jordan Reed. I mean, there's a lot of things to look at. The thing to be excited for for, for, for Washington is that defense. You know, you got probably one of the better defenses on paper. Um, you know, they've been able to play well. And if you, if you go with the old school, let's look at, look at what the Steelers did with Big Ben. Run the ball, play defense. Run the ball, play defense. If, if that's the formula that you come up with, Protect the football, run the ball well, and play solid defense. You may find your you may find your way to a you know a nine and seven. You may find mm-hmm. your way to a eight and eight year, but don't don't look at it and be like oh another eight and eight year. Like no, you got to understand you're working towards building something. And I think if you temper that temper your expectations and know what the ultimate goal is, you'll be all right. Well, the thing that I'm always, that, yeah, I'm always me, optimistic about my team unless you know Josh Scobie's kicking. Well, the thing that got me was, I mean, they tried to replace Greg Minuski, who I didn't think did a good job. So I was happy about that. But then they interviewed so many people, they couldn't get any of them. And then they're like, oh, well, we had Minuski sitting in on the interviews. Now, if an employer's going to fire me, I'm not sitting in on the interviews. They're going to hire somebody and then fire me. Yeah. So yeah. I'm just like, the whole way that organization runs, and I remember – they would say we need more out of Anthony. I'm like, well, you you give it him one reception this whole season. How are you going to get more out of him? Hey, you know, we hey, like, 
That's a whole other rant, man. We'd be going for a whole other hour. <laughs> I mean, I hear your kid. I hear you got your kid with you, but uh, yeah. if your kid, if if your child wanted to play football, would you let them, or would you would you try to steer them in a different direction? Like my people ask me all the time if my kids want to join the military, am I going to make? Am I going to let them join the military? I was like, I always say yes, but I'm going to try and push them to the Air Force because they're not going to get shot as much in the Air Force. Yeah, I mean, I would I would definitely let them play. Um, I know the you know the concussion thing and that that scares a lot of people off. Um, and it's you know you, did you know like you're you're probably more likely to get a concussion playing soccer. You know really? they because all the headers like they've eliminated heading the ball in youth soccer. Hmm. Because I mean my wife played soccer and she's had a couple of concussions growing up. Um, I mean, it, and it's something that I, I, I want. I don't expect my kids to be big enough to be playing on the O-line, so they're not going to have a whole bunch of consistent contact. Um, I, I feel like they're going to be s- small, thin, and fast, and they're going to be out on the edge somewhere, so they shouldn't be getting hit as much. But there's, there's, there's so many ways that you can bump your head and get a concussion to where I, I, I want to walk around here scared um, and limit my child for what they want to do. But now if you start looking at, you know, monetarily, um, yeah, get out here. If you're tall enough, we're going to play basketball. I'm going to teach you how to swing a bat. You know what I mean? I want to teach you how to pitch a baseball because that's where the big bucks are. Um, <laughs> and, and you don't have to get beat up as much. I mean, we're going to you know, live on a golf course, so you're going to come out here and swing a stick. You well, know? In baseball, so you, can... you play in your pajamas anyway, right? Exactly. Exactly. Right? Wrong. So I mean, hey, hey. I mean, David. David Wells threw a perfect game with a hangover. You know what I mean? Like that's the type of sport you know, that, you can, that I can get down on, right? You know, you, oh, you, you pitch once every five days. You know what I mean? I mean, shoot. It, it's it's hard to. There's, it's there's hard no to there's no salary cap pitch. either. So. Exactly. So I mean, there's no telling what those contracts would look like down the line, but. I'm going to open my kids up to every, every sport that they want to try. You know, I'm not going to limit awesome. them and be like, don't play football because you're going to hurt your head. Uh, I think once you play, if you're, if you're going into it scared like that, you know, you, something will happen. Um, but I think it's just a part of growing up. You know, go out there, push some people around. It's, I think you learn the most out of football. Uh, it's, it's like a, it's the ultimate life personified you know you yeah got hard times you got to go against bigger people you got to you know deal with different personalities all in the same locker room and very few sports where you have to combine you know, physical challenges with mental challenges and you just have all those things meshed into one you know 60 minute ball game uh, i've learned more out of life and i shoot i use i use football to help me get through tough times in real estate i'm like i wrote a quote down i was like sometimes you get and this is you can edit it if you want to but i said sometimes you have to remember the badass shit you've done you know yeah and i'm like hey I've, I've done some badass shit in my life so having a having a down quarter in real estate that's not going to break me um you know got chad greenway jumped through my chest on a play uh, and i got up <laughs> from it so i think i'm gonna be okay <laughs> You know, oh yeah, yeah. There's a few hard times that happen in my life. You know what I'm saying? Absolutely. Well, I think I speak on behalf of all of us when I say we really appreciate your uh, humbleness and your uh, ability to be free enough for enough time to do this podcast with us. We yeah, certainly man. appreciate it. Yeah, and um, we would love to have you back yeah, during the season back. to to talk about what's going on during the season. Oh uh, yeah, for sure, man. No worries. I'll do that. You know, uh, continue if you want to borrow three two-year-old girls, just let me know, and I'll send them your way. <laughs> oh my! Uh, so I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna assume you don't have any hair. I have. I have hair, but it's it's receding quickly. Yeah, yeah, that, yeah. You got girls, man. That's... <laughs> Anybody I know who's got girls is a little. They're either bald or thin on the top. So. <laughs> but I also have a shotgun for each one of them. So when they start bringing boys to the house. You need that. It's like bad boys. It's like that scene in Bad Boys. You're gonna be on lock. Oh down. yeah. That... <laughs> be like, That's how funny. old are you? It's like fifteen. You look damn near thirty. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's how it plays, man. That's how it plays. So again, guys, his website 
check it out even if you're not in the market for a house just just check it out anyway just because it's www.agentarmstrong.realtor www.agentarmstrong.realtor um this is chris sarge myself and anthony armstrong checking up out of here see you guys later